All right, guys. So this is going to be the last section for chapter 27, which is also our last chapter. Very exciting. All right. So in this lecture, we are going to cover the male reproductive system. Uh, all right. So let's start with an overview of the male reproductive system. Okay, so we'll just talk about an overview of some of the structures and their functions, and then we can go through each of them in detail. So first uh, are the testes. So these are the primary reproductive structures. They're gonna produce uh, the sperm and uh, also make the sex hormones, all right? So t uh, primarily testosterone, all right? Being made by the testes. Okay, there we go, all right? And so then the next structure is the scrotum. So the scrotum surrounds the testes, right? So it's the layer of skin, connective tissue, and muscle around the testes. Uh, the scrotum is gonna function to uh, maintain a very uh, specific temperature in the testes that's needed for sperm production. Okay, and so then um, sperm are produced in the testes and they're going to travel through a series of ducts, all right? So once they're made in the seminiferous tubules of the testes, they're going to travel through uh, the epididymis, the ductus or vas deferens, all right, the ejaculatory duct, and when it reaches the ejaculatory duct, it's going to combine with secretions from other glands to form semen. Uh, and then uh, that semen will enter the urethra, okay? So then those accessory glands that are going to contribute to uh, semen, right? So the fluid to semen, uh, those are going to be the um, seminal glands, all right? The prostate gland and the bulbourethral gland, okay? So we'll talk about each of those. All right, and so uh, one other little note. So the testes descend during the last month of pregnancy, all right? And so it's important to understand the structure of the scrotum and what's contained in it uh, to understand that when the testes descend, all right, they actually move through the anterior abdominal wall. And as they do that, they're gonna take that parietal peritoneum the muscle, any kind of fatty tissue and skin with them, okay? So they're covered by these layers and layers of tissue that they move through when they descend. Okay, so now the scrotum. Okay, so the scrotum is skin and superficial fascia and muscle that surrounds the testes. And so as I mentioned, they function to give the sperm a like, perfect environment to develop. And so the sperm need a cooler environment, all right? Three degrees cooler than body temperature, okay? And so being that the testes are outside of the actual body, right? They are cooler, right? They're slightly away from that body heat. And so they can be a little cooler. And so then we do wanna contain, like keep that temperature at a very, um, regular level, right? So we want homeostasis of that temperature. And so we don't want the testes becoming too cold. That would hinder sperm production, all right? And so how cold or warm the testes are is controlled by two specific muscles, okay? And that's gonna be, the first one is the dartos muscle, all right? The dartos muscle is smooth muscle and it's gonna to function to wrinkle the exterior surface of the scrotum, all right? So by wrinkling the surface of the scrotum, it's gonna increase the thickness, the surface area of the scrotum, and that is gonna elevate <clears throat> the temperature, all right? So that will warm the scrotum. So if it's becoming too cold, this dartos muscle will contract, wrinkle the surface of the scrotum, and help to elevate that temperature. All right, so the cremaster muscle also functions to elevate the temperature um, of the testes, and it does that by actually elevating the testes and pulling them closer to the body, right? So it can kind of be closer to that body temperature. And so the cremaster muscle actually arises from the internal obliques, right? The abdominal muscles. So when the testes descend, move through the abdominal wall, 
they take a portion of that internal oblique muscle with them, all right, and that becomes the cremaster muscle, and so it can elevate, pull the testes upwards. All right, so that's gonna increase the temperature. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the testes. Okay, so with the testes, uh, inside of the testes, let's kind of look at this diagram here, right? Inside of the testes, we have a series of very tightly coiled tubules called seminiferous tubules, okay? So all of these out here are gonna be seminiferous tubules. Okay, so actually we can just label those really quick. All right, so seminiferous tubules. Okay, and these seminiferous tubules uh, are going to be very, very tightly coiled. Again, there's like uh, approximately a thousand of these tubules per testis. Okay, so they're very tightly packed. And this is the site of spermatogenesis, so sperm production. Okay, and so let's talk about spermatogenesis very briefly, all right, um, looking at this picture. So if we take a cross section, right, through the testes like this, we can look at a cross section of one of those seminiferous tubules and see um, what's going on with the spermatogenesis. So I'm going to zoom into this picture here, all right, and we can look at these different cells. So this is our cross section of a seminiferous tubule. And so then what we're looking at here is one, so this would just be one seminiferous tubule here, all right? And so then on the very outer edge of the seminiferous tubule, we would have our stem cells, all right? So if you remember, those are called spermatogonia. All right, so our spermatogonia are gonna sit on the very outer edge of our seminiferous tubules. So like that would be a spermatogonia right there, okay? So those are gonna be stem cells. They're gonna undergo mitosis. And so as they do, right, the cells they produce are gonna start undergoing meiosis to become sperm. All right, so if you remember the first cell produced during meiosis one, right, that cell that's in meiosis one is called a primary spermatocyte. And you can distinguish a primary spermatocyte because their DNA kind of condenses and starts to look really spotty. Okay, so I'm gonna put here, right, primary spermatocyte. Okay, and we can point to one. All right, and so this, we can actually point to a couple. All right, so that would be a primary spermatocyte. So it's DNA, its nucleus, is looking very spotty. And usually the nucleus gets very large too, so that would be another one there. Okay, so that's primary. Once these cells reach meiosis two, they become secondary spermatocytes. All right, so let me write secondary spermatocyte. Okay, and so their nucleus becomes a little smaller, more condensed, you don't see the little dots in it anymore, all right? So this would be a secondary spermatocyte, all right? And so I don't see all that many little spermatids, and so I'm gonna to explain to you what the spermatids would look like. Um, now that I'm looking at this, yeah, maybe a couple of them like here and here. All right, so, but what they're gonna look like is little, kind of they're like elongated and they look like sperm and they're embedded in these supportive cells in the seminiferous tubules called Sertoli cells, okay? And so Sertoli cells, uh, you can kind of see one here, right? They have this kind of larger nucleus with a very prominent single nucleolus in them, right? So this would be another Sertoli cell, the nucleus of a Sertoli cell. All right, and they're actually, if I were to draw this whole Sertoli cell, if we could see the whole thing, it would be this giant cell, right, that reaches all the way to the inside like that of the seminiferous tubule, okay? That would be a Sertoli or a nurse cell. And so 
what happens is the spermatid, they embed into that nurse cell, right, and start to develop into sperm. They start that process. So you would see, you would know you were looking at a spermatid because you would have like this little kind of elongated, almost looking like the head of a sperm, all right, structure, and you could see usually some kind of flagellum coming out into the um, middle of that seminiferous tubule. All right, so let me label this Sertoli cell really quick. All right, so these are the support cells, all right, and they kind of function to give those, we'll talk about them in a minute, give those developing sperm a place to, you know, grow, right, and it nourishes them, okay? So that's spermatogenesis, and remember, it's occurring in the seminiferous tubules. Okay, and so then around the seminiferous tubules, we have this connective tissue layer called the tunica al uh, albuginea, all right, and that's this white structure here. Okay, so that is the tunica, I'll label it really quick. All right, so the tunica, Oof, that's rough. Okay, let me give myself a little more space. So then you can actually read what I write. All right, so the tunica, albuginea, that is this white layer here. All right, so it's a fibrous tissue layer that surrounds the seminiferous tubules. All right, so after the uh, sperm are released from their Sertoli cells, right, so they've developed enough to be released from the Sertoli cells, they're gonna travel through the Reti testis. So the Reti testis just connects the seminiferous tubule to the epididymis, right? So it's just like this little network of tubules. You can see it right here, right? That's the Reti testis. It's like this little mesh network of tubules connecting our seminiferous tubules here to the epididymis out here. Okay, so we can label, we'll just write it here. Reti testis, all right? That is gonna be there, okay? So then from there, the Reti testis, the sperm would travel into the epididymis, all right? So the epididymis is where spermiogenesis, right, the process of going from a spermatid to an actual sperm with a flagellum and a head, all right, that's where that process finishes. Okay, so let's talk about spermiogenesis really quick, all right, but firstly we'll label really quick our epididymis. Okay, so that's going to be here. All right. So this process, the spermiogenesis, starts in the seminiferous tubules with the Sertoli cells, all right? So our spermatids start developing uh, in the seminiferous tubules with those Sertoli cells. The Sertoli cells act as a protective blood testes barrier, and so they're protecting the sperm from the immune system, all right? Because those sperm actually don't have the kind of self-cell signals that most cells would when they're developing. And so the Sertoli cells help to protect them from uh, the immune system. Kind of like surrounds them, protects them, provides a barrier between these developing uh, sperm and the immune system. All right, so that's called the blood testes barrier. Okay, and then the Sertoli cells are also going to function to nourish and support the sperm as they are developing. All right, uh, and so the Sertoli cells also secrete two very important components. The first one is androgen binding protein, All right? Both of these are going to work to regulate levels of testosterone. So androgen binding protein is going to keep... Uh, testosterone levels elevated, all right? So this is going to increase testosterone, okay? And then inhibins are actually going to kind of do the opposite. So inhibins are gonna be made when the sperm count is high, okay? So it's kind of a negative feedback, right? Made 
when sperm count increases, okay, so inhibins are released when the sperm count increases, and they are going to inhibit the release of follicle-stimulating hormone, right? So follicle-stimulating hormone increases um, sperm production, spermatogenesis. So if we want to inhibit that, all right, we would inhibit the release of follicle-stimulating hormone, all right? So it decreases release of follicle stimulating hormone, okay? And so that is gonna be negative feedback to kind of regulate the amount of sperm production, all right? Okay, good, all right, so then spermiation, uh, this process is going to occur now in the epididymis, right? So spermiation is going to be kind of the last step in spermiogenesis, all right? And it is going to occur once those developing sperm, they're going to be released by the Sertoli cell. They're going to travel to the epididymis. They're going to become sperm, all right? So this is a picture kind of classic what we think of as a sperm. So we're going from a cell, just like a normal kind of round cell with a nucleus, to something like this, okay? And so what we need during this process of spermiation is for those cells to gain a flagellum. All right, so that's the tail that the sperm used to swim. Okay, so the flagellum is just full of microtubules, right? Microtubules are important for movement. They can produce movement, right? Like our mitotic spindles and mitosis are made of microtubules. So microtubules move things. So our flagellum is made of microtubules. In order for it to move, you need a lot of ATP. And so then that's the reason for this next part called the midpiece. All right. And that mid piece is going to be chock full of mitochondria. All right, mitochondria and all kinds of, you know, glucose and nutrients that we need, the sperm will need to make ATP to fuel the swimming with that flagellum. Okay, so that's going to be in the mid piece. Okay, and then we have the head here, right? It's going to contain all the DNA and genetic information. And then lastly, we have the acrosome. All right, that's kind of the cap on the end here. Okay, and so the acrosome, yeah, let's put DNA here. That's gonna be inside the head. The acrosome is gonna contain a bunch of uh, enzymes. All right, so these are gonna be kind of digestive enzymes that are gonna allow that sperm when it reaches the egg to actually penetrate the egg, uh, resulting in fertilization, All right? So these are gonna be enzymes to penetrate egg. Okay, so those are the things that this spermatid during spermiation are gonna need to gain, all right? So that's what's going on with the process of spermiation. So we are gonna gain our flagellum, our midpiece. We're gonna condense down, get rid of a lot of cytoplasm and condense down all that DNA just to this head region. And then we're gonna add the acrosome with those digestive enzymes. All right, and so we know that in order for this process to occur, we need a series of hormones. Okay, and so FSH is the hormone from the uh, pituitary, the anterior pituitary. that increases sperm production, all right? Um, and so uh, it actually causes androgen binding protein to be released, and that is gonna increase testosterone, as we talked about. And then production of this FSH can be inhibited, as we said, by inhibins, uh, which are released when sperm count is um, at a certain level, okay? So when we have a high sperm count, will decrease the amount of FSH being released. Then there was also luteinizing hormone we mentioned in our endocrine chapter. All right, so LH 
uh, in females causes ovulation in males it's going to act on Leydig cells okay and so Leydig cells are cells in between the seminiferous tubules so if we look back up here at our picture all right so these would be our we have zero room for a label all right we'll put it down here all right so Leydig cells are cells in between the seminiferous tubules so they would be kind of like right out here okay so those cells and they're going to produce testosterone all right so the Leydig cells they're also sometimes called interstitial cells and they produce testosterone they're stimulated by luteinizing hormone all right So that's the process of spermiation that's happening in the epididymis. Let's talk a little bit more about the epididymis. So the epididymis we know is connected to the testes, right? They're connected by tubules to each other. And it actually sits on the outside of the testes, all right? So this would be the epididymis. And so the epididymis has a head and then a body and then it has this uh, tail here okay and so it kind of wraps around the outer edge of the testes okay and so the function of the epididymis is to finish spermiogenesis all right that spermiation so it's going to finish converting a spermatid into a sperm we just talked about that process and it's also going to store sperm, all right? So the epididymis can store sperm for several months. Whoops. Several months. Okay. Let's talk about the histology for a second because that's important for its function. And uh, so histology for the mucosa, all right, of the uh, epididymis, the tubules in the epididymis, it's going to contain simple columnar or pseudostratified tissue. Okay, and this tissue is going to be a little bit uh, unique because it's going to contain very large microvilli. Okay, and so these microvilli are non motile so this just means that they're very stiff and rigid right they don't move okay so they're these long rigid kind of extensions of the cells and so they have several functions all right so they're going to absorb fluid right testicular fluid And so that'll help reduce uh, and prevent edema from occurring. Uh, they're also going to nourish the sperm that are developing and being stored in the epididymis. And their function, they're gonna function to actually remove old dead sperm that die in the epididymis. Okay, so they can remove dead sperm. All right, so that's those simple columnar <clears throat> pseudostratified cells that have these large non-motile microvilli. All right, the epididymis also contains a layer of smooth muscle that is going to function in peristalsis. All right, so smooth muscle for peristalsis, so that's just moving the sperm along through that epididymis. Okay, good. All right, so then from the epididymis, sperm would travel next through the ductus, or sometimes called vas deferens, all right? So the ductus, or the vas deferens, you can see leaving here, right, is going to leave and travel out through this structure called the spermatic cord. Okay, so we have here, actually, I'll just label it like that. All right, so that is the spermatic cord. All 
and then we have our ductus deferens here. Okay, all right, so the ductus deferens is gonna leave through the spermatic cord. Uh, also, <clears throat> in the spermatic cord, you can see, right, there's a bunch of additional structures. The spermatic cord contains the ductus deferens. Uh, it also contains blood vessels, uh, lymph vessels, and lots of different nerves, right? And we mentioned that cremaster muscle as well is in there, all right? So the cremaster that elevates the testes travels through that spermatic cord and nerves, okay? And so something that can happen with the spermatic cord is called testicular torsion, right? And so uh, this is very dangerous. It compromises blood flow to the testes. And so what happens is that the testes um, rotate, right, in the scrotum. Okay, so they start to rotate and that causes torsion, right? It rotates this spermatic cord and it kind of pinches all of the structures inside of it. Okay, and so that uh, obviously compromises blood flow, right? If you're pinching those blood vessels, there will be swelling and edema, right? We're cutting off those lymphatic vessels. Uh, it'll be very painful. We're pinching the nerves. Also, the edema itself would be painful. Uh, the lack of oxygen uh, causes pain receptors to be activated. And so typically, this happens in uh, young men between the age of 12 and 18 years old, right? It's most common uh, in that age range, okay? Uh, and so we'll just write a couple <clears throat> compromises, blood flow, we'll just say pain, edema, right? And decreased oxygen to the testes, which that's associated with the reduced blood flow. Okay, and so then obviously somebody, uh, a, young, a young man with that issue would need to go see uh, a physician immediately, all right. Okay, so histology of the ductus deferens, it's going to contain the pseudostratified tissue and it's going to contain muscularis, all right, and so most of these tubules we're going to talk about contain muscularis and that is for peristalsis. All right, so moving those uh, sperm forward, right? So peristalsis just to keep those sperm moving forward. Okay. All right, so now we have our ductus deferens, all right? And so I wanna show you on this picture kind of how they travel, all right? So the ductus deferens, this, so this would be the testes, all right? This would be the epididymis around the testes. And so then here we have the ductus deferens. And so the ductus deferens travel up, right? They're gonna move at some point in that spermatic cord, right? They're gonna move through the abdominal wall and enter the abdominal cavity, right? From there, they're gonna wrap up and around this structure, which would be a ureter, right? And they're gonna kind of wrap behind that ureter, all right? And then they're gonna join with this structure we're gonna talk about next, the seminal vesicle. All right, they're gonna join that seminal vesicle and empty into the urethra, okay? And so where the ductus deferens joins the seminal vesicle is called the ejaculatory duct, all right? So this is gonna be the ductus deferens and the seminal vesicle. All right, so it's where they join. Okay, so this, so let's do a little labeling really quick. So you guys will have this with your notes. So the ductus deferens is gonna be here, all right? It has kind of this enlarged area called an ampulla. We're not gonna worry about that. All right, uh, just the whole thing we're gonna call ductus deferens. And we have the, whoops. 
seminal vesicle. All right, it's going to be this structure here. And then just for reference, ureter. All right, this is a ureter. Okay, and so then our ductus deferens and our seminal vesicle are going to join, and then that is going to form the, let me mute my computer, there we go, ejaculatory duct. And so it's very small in this picture. All right, most models in the lab will show it a little larger. Okay, so that's the ejaculatory duct there where the seminal vesicle has joined uh, with the ductus deferens. Okay, and so then they're going to empty into um, the prostatic urethra, all right, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Okay, so seminal vesicle, what does it do? So the seminal vesicle is going to contribute 60% of the seminal fluid, all right? So the majority of the seminal fluid comes from the seminal vesicle. Let's talk about some of the components. All right, so it's going to contain fructose from, for uh, nourishment, okay? It's going to be very alkaline, all right? So this is going to function to uh, kind of protect the sperm from, remember, urine is very acidic, right? So if there's residual urine in the urethra, this kind of alkaline secretion will protect the sperm from uh, that acidic urine. And also, remember we said the vagina, right, the mucosa of the vagina itself is also very acidic. So we do need kind of this alkaline secretion surrounding the sperm to protect them from acidic conditions, right? Okay, and then also from the seminal vesicle, we're going to have the addition of prostaglandins. And so prostaglandins are going to facilitate movement of the sperm, all right? So they're kind of swimming movement, all right? So it increases sperm movement. Okay. And then also in this secretion from the seminal vesicle, we're gonna have clotting proteins. And actually one of them, we've already learned with our blood vessels and our blood chapter is fibrinogen. Okay, and so um, semen will, after a short period of time, uh, after ejaculation, it will clot, right? That's from these clotting proteins. And that will uh, help it to kind of stay in place and so then that'll give the sperm a better chance to be able to swim and reach the egg for fertilization. So that's the function of those clotting proteins. All right. Okay. So that's from the seminal vesicle. All right. Some of the fluid in semen, seminal fluid, also comes from the prostate gland. All right. So the prostate gland is going to contain those two ejaculatory ducts, right, from either side and the urethra. Okay, so those are going to travel through the prostate. The part of the urethra that moves through the prostate is called the prostatic urethra. All right, great name. Okay. All right, and so it is going to contribute 30% of that seminal fluid. Okay, and so in that seminal fluid, we're going to have citrate, right? We're going to have something called prostate-specific antigen, okay? And so this prostate-specific antigen is going to dissolve that clot, all right, when those sperm are ready to start swimming for the egg, okay? So that clot forms to kind of keep everything in place. All right, and then when the sperm are ready to start moving towards the egg, this prostate-specific antigen is going to help to dissolve that clot. Okay, and then also the proteases here are going to be doing the same thing, right? They're, they're going to also dissolve the clot. And then we have seminal plasmin. So seminal plasmin is in prostatic secretion, and it just is an antibiotic, all right?
So it just helps reduce the possibility of bacterial growth. Okay, good. All right, so then uh, we have our last kind of accessory gland. That's the Cowper's gland. So the Cowper's gland is going to secrete an alkaline mucus, and it's going to secrete it into the urethra. All right, so an alkaline mucus into the urethra. And so this is specifically to neutralize the acidity of urine. All right, so it's going to neutralize urine. Again, to protect those sperm from the acidity of the urine. Okay, now let's talk about the urethra. Okay, so the urethra, the male urethra, uh, since it is much longer than the female urethra, is divided into three distinct regions. So we have the prostatic urethra, right? It's going to travel through the prostate. Okay, and so then if we label it here, all right, so this is going to be prostatic, and it's kind of partially cut off. You can see on the picture above the whole thing, all right, but this would be the prostatic urethra. And then the next segment is the uh, membranous urethra, okay, and so the membranous urethra travels through the muscles of the perineum. And I'll point to it in just a second. All right, the perineum. Okay, and so that would be uh, membranous. Okay, so that's going to be this segment right here. All right, so it would—it's very short. All right, so it's just this little tiny segment right here. That's the membranous urethra. Okay, and so the muscle of the perineum that they're referring to is here. All right, so it's just that little segment that moves through that muscle. And you can actually see here and here, these are the Cowper's glands, right? They're going to be releasing that alkaline secretion here into the urethra. Okay, so we have the membranous urethra. And then lastly, we have the penile, or sometimes referred to as the spongy urethra. Okay, so this is going to travel through the penis. Okay, so this would be the penile urethra here. Okay. All right, and so just really quick for each of those regions, let's mention the type of tissue found there. So the prostatic urethra is going to contain transitional epithelium. All right, and so that is the type of tissue we have in the bladder. So that transitional epithel epithelium will continue uh, into that prostate. All right, so we have transitional. Okay, and then the membranous urethra is going to contain pseudostratified. All right, so pseudostratified in the membranous portion, and then the penile urethra is going to contain stratified squamous. Okay. All right. Okay, so now let's discuss uh, the kind of anatomy of the penis, and then the physiology of that will come in when we discuss uh, the physiology of sexual intercourse. Okay, so the penis is the copulatory organ, all right? That just means that its responsibility, its job, is to deliver sperm, okay? So it's the copulatory organ. Uh, we have kind of the, like, the body of the penis, right? There's the root of the penis up here, and then the body, and then you have the glands penis here, which would be kind of the enlarged, end or the enlarged tip of the penis is called the glands penis all right and then the glands penis is covered by so we'll just say there we go so the enlarged 
too. And then it's covered by a layer of skin called the prepuce or the foreskin. Okay, and so it's a skin that extends distally and forms a cuff around the gland's penis. All right, so this is, we'll just say a cuff of skin around the gland's penis. Okay, so we can label these on this picture. All right, so first, the gland's penis would be here, all right? And then you can see the foreskin or the prepuce all right here, okay? And so it's actually this whole entire cuff of skin here, and you can see it on either side, right? That's the foreskin. Okay, uh, and then within the penis there is erectile tissue all right and so this erectile tissue is spongy connective tissue meaning it's connective tissue with a bunch of spaces it actually looks like a sponge right kind of like they've drawn it here this blue tissue is all erectile tissue and so it has all these spaces because during the formation of an erection these spaces are going to fill with blood all right let me kind of be writing this. So it's going to fill with blood. And then what's going to happen is that as it fills uh, and it starts, an erection starts to form, all right, it's going to cut off and compress the veins. All right, so veins are compressed. Right, so that means that there's blood coming in, but no blood is leaving. All right, so we'll just say, here we go, no blood out. And that is how an actual erection is formed. Okay, so that erectile tissue, that spongy tissue, fills with blood to the point where <clears throat> it compresses the veins. All right, and that means that that blood cannot leave. Okay, so now you have the spongy tissue filled with blood that can't leave. That is what an erection is. Okay, and so the two types of spongy tissue in the penis are called the corpora cavernosa. All right, so these are the two dorsal cylinders of erectile tissue. Okay, and so you can see them right here and then the other one would be here, right? So two here, dorsal cylinders, okay? And then you have the corpora spongiosum, and this is gonna be the portion that surrounds the urethra. All right, so that's why sometimes the penile urethra is called the spongy urethra. It's surrounded by this corpora spongiosum. Okay. So then that would be kind of this inner layer of blue here. All right, so that's the erectile tissue. So let's talk about kind of the physiology behind sexual intercourse, all right? So this is gonna be, we're gonna talk about kind of the, the involvement of the nervous system here, all right, with sexual intercourse. So the first stage of sexual intercourse is what we just talked about, the formation of an erection. And so this is actually mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system. All right, so it's mediated by the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, and actually through the release of the neurotransmitter, I think this is really interesting, all right? So the neurotransmitter involved here is nitrous oxide. All right, so that's just abbreviated in O, nitrous oxide. Okay, so that's the neurotransmitter involved uh, from the parasympathetic nervous system to uh, the formation of a, of a um, erection, all right? And so we talked about 
that um, there's erectile tissue in the penis. There is also erectile tissue in the clitoris, right? So there is also, that means a female erection in addition to the male erection we just discussed. Okay, so that's kind of the first stage, all right? The second event that happens is lubrication, okay? We talked about these glands that produce lubricating mucuses, all right? So in males, they were the Cowper's glands, all right? So they're gonna secrete that alkaline mucus, all right, that's gonna increase the pH for the sperm in the urethra and then in the females those are going to be the Bartholin's glands right they're homologous to the Cowper's glands right those are the Bartholin's glands okay and so they're going to provide lubrication all right, and then lastly, okay, the, the kind of last stage is orgasm. So with females, um, there is an orgasm. So the female orgasm um, involves contraction, so more so like muscular contraction. There are some instances of female ejaculation, but generally it involves uh, muscle contraction. All right, so this would be kind of like a rhythmic muscular contraction, and that's going to be of the uh, pelvic floor muscles and the uterus, right? So there are some uterine, very, you know, not, very mild uterine contractions. We'll say uterus. Okay, so that's the female orgasm. And then with the male... Right, this would be referred to as ejaculation. Whoops, I did not need to rewrite that. I didn't notice my next line. All right, so. Okay, and so for both male and females, all right, let me give myself a little room here. This is mediated by now the sympathetic nervous system. All right, so up until this point, right, it's been the parasympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for kind of the first portion of sexual intercourse, and then it switches to the sympathetic nervous system for orgasm. Okay, and so associated with orgasm is an increase in blood pressure, an increase in heart rate, uh, increase in body temperature, right? you get hot uh, and sweating, right? So increase, we'll just put increase in blood pressure and heart rate, right? All the things we know are associated with activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, all right, so that's for males and females, right? It's mediated by the sympathetic nervous system, okay? All right, so that is it for chapter 27.